Acho que gostaríamos de confraternizar com quem estiver disponível. É, passando para a próxima palestra, tenho o prazer de convidar o senhor Brett Kugelmas. Ele é o criador do Titans of Nuclear e fundador do Energy Impact Center. É, a palestra dele será feita em inglês. Bom dia. Muito obrigado por me convidar para o seu lindo país. It is an honor to present in a country that has such a wonderful culture and also such a rich nuclear tradition as well. But we have been a leader in clean energy for a long time. And this is why I come here today to ask for your help. My country has accomplished a tremendous amount with nuclear technology. But we find ourselves, for the last 50 years, tripping over our own feet. So today, I will explain what in the US we are doing incorrectly, how we have led the whole world down the wrong path, and how Brazil may be our greatest hope for a worldwide nuclear revival. Perhaps first I should start with my story. I'm not from the nuclear industry. As I was formally trained as a mechanical engineer, and after receiving my master's in robotics from Stanford University, I started a company that developed the first autonomous aircraft for the commercial sector, following in the footsteps of the great Alberto Santos Dumont. In the early years, we had many challenges to overcome. Public opinion was not in our favor, as drones were considered military weapons. The technology was very complex, and the failure of any system could mean the entire device would fall from the sky and be destroyed. And the regulations were strict, written in another era for giant aircraft, with conservatism built into the law and regulatory culture as well. <clears throat> Challenging public opinion, technology, and regulations. I wonder if this sounds familiar? But despite such obstacles, we persisted. We raised private capital, negotiated with regulators, developed the technology, built a manufacturing line, and we brought unmanned aviation to the world, forever transforming many industries, such as construction, insurance, and even environmental protection. It was here that I developed a love for the environment, as our drones mapped millions of acres of forest, wetland, coastline, and more. So after five years of growth, when given the opportunity to sell my business and pursue any new challenge of my choosing, it was the largest threat to the environment, climate change, that became my mission. When I first embarked upon this journey, I thought it was to combat an existential threat to our planet. And I couldn't imagine a more worthy pursuit But as I progressed, I realized the trade-offs were not so simple. See, although we don't perceive energy very much throughout the day, it's far more than just petrol and leaving the lights on longer. Energy is embedded in food, in medicine, in buildings. Energy moves goods and people around the world. Energy is inside everything you need, and energy is at the core of what you love about a prosperous world. <clears throat> Restricting energy, on the other hand, with higher costs, means real hardship is spread throughout every part of life. The poorer you are, the worse it hurts. This is why we subsidize all types of energy including dirty ones, as the benefits of inexpensive power have a truly profound, positive impact on quality of life. For most of the world, especially the poorest, less access to energy could actually hurt them more than climate change will. And they would feel it immediately, every day, 
in everything that they do. Let's observe a very similar decision regarding energy access that humanity has already made. You are blessed here with abundant hydropower, but in the rest of the world, even in the US, we knowingly continue to pollute the air with particulate, causing millions of cancers and asthmas every single year just to receive slightly cheaper energy. We have had the medical reasons and the technology to replace coal for over half a century. But the only thing that ever meaningfully has is another cheaper form of power. Do we really expect a worldwide consensus on sacrifice now across all age, class, and creed to combat a threat distant in time and place? What the climate elite ignore is that to anyone but the absolute wealthiest, electing for more expensive energy isn't even a consideration. Over time, I came to realize tackling climate change would be impossible unless emissions-free energy, clean energy, was also the cheapest. As I ran a cost model for all known available sources, I found myself at a total loss as to why nuclear energy already the cleanest, already the most abundant, already the most powerful, why wasn't it already the cheapest? In a normal thermal power plant, fuel accounts for about three quarters of the price of the electricity that comes out. And in a nuclear plant, the fuel has an insignificant cost. Shouldn't as the industry mature, its electricity cost one quarter that of coal? Why is new nuclear $100 per megawatt hour instead of $10 per megawatt hour? As a mechanical engineer, as an entrepreneur, I understood it's not that simple. But I couldn't fathom what would account for such a grave disparity. At that point, I swore I would meet the entire nuclear industry if I had to, to answer this question. How is it possible that with such incredible intrinsic advantages, nuclear isn't the only source of power on planet Earth? Through the Titans of Nuclear podcast, I have had the pleasure of interviewing over a thousand experts across technology, industry, economics, policy, regulations, and more. I've completed over 100 site visits to research centers, power plants, universities, and conferences in over a dozen countries, and I've asked over 10,000 questions along the way, all while trying to answer, why isn't nuclear energy the cheapest energy on planet Earth? And what would it take to make it so? As a child, I remember thinking that a nuclear accident was the definition of catastrophe. That Chernobyl poisoned a million people. That Fukushima killed thousands. That nuclear waste was just waiting to find its way into our water. But as an engineer, I thought those were solvable problems. It soon became apparent that I wasn't the only one that thought that way. As I got to know the nuclear industry, I discovered a paralyzing contradiction, that none of those assumed hazards were even remotely possible and yet there existed a community of 100,000 scientists and engineers dedicating their careers to solving those problems nonetheless. It turns out 
However ironic that in trying to shield the public from minor nuclear hazards with extraordinary measures of protection, that the nuclear industry has been convincing the whole world, and to a large part themselves, that nuclear energy was in fact an extraordinary threat. Let us discuss nuclear waste and nuclear accidents to demonstrate how for the last 40 years, everything that we've been trying to do to make things better, technologically and socially, have in fact been making things worse. It's not the environmentalists. It's not big oil. It's not the association with the bomb. It is insisting on excessive protection that has scared the public. We have been our own worst enemy. The theory of hazard with nuclear waste is that if it entered the environment, it would find its way into our food and water and somehow give people cancer. We have been designing solutions to prevent this for so long that we no longer even challenge the premise, even though this is impossible. It was Chernobyl that definitively proved that out of every radioisotope that could ever come out of a power reactor, only iodine-131 is of concern. We are now three decades later, and we know that not cesium, nor strontium, nor any other isotope of iodine caused any damage to humans. And that's at Chernobyl levels of contamination. But when discussing how to handle nuclear waste, we forget that by definition, there is no iodine-131 left after just a few months. It has a half-life of just eight days. The very thing that makes certain isotopes dangerous is the very thing that makes them last not so long. Just because some isotopes are radioactive for millions of years, it doesn't mean that waste is harmful for millions of years. In fact, it is only by consolidating waste that we have created the hazard of proximity where there needn't be one at all. Society has always had two extremely effective strategies for all toxins that industry creates. And we know they work because every other industry creates thousands of times as much waste as nuclear. Our two strategies, we either place it in a landfill or we dilute it and dump it into the environment. Dilution is perfect. Dilution is why we feel safe adding chlorine to our drinking water, even though we would never drink a glass of concentrated cleaning supplies that contain chlorine. Landfill is also great. Toss it in a pile of dirt and that's it. Very cheap. If it slowly leaches into the environment, into the groundwater, that's a good thing. Because by definition, that would also slowly dilute it, rendering it harmless. Nuclear waste is not a special hazard. It is our actions that create the threat. It is our actions that create public fear. Both the technical and societal answer to solving the nuclear waste problem is the same. Treat it like you would any other industrial waste stream. Now, let us discuss nuclear accidents. The theory here that this is a hazard to the public from light water reactors Et absurdo. 
A meltdown means you have boiled off your coolant, which means you have boiled off your moderator, which means you have no more criticality and a known quantity of decay heat to deal with. It's enough to melt some metal, dissolve concrete, but even the 450,000 kilojoules from a gigawatt scale reactor is not enough to melt more than a few feet of dirt. The fuel is worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Economic incentives alone would be sufficient to make sure that this almost never happens. But mandating perfection through law makes any system more complex. It makes an accident more likely to happen, and it makes it more dangerous when it does. We have already seen this play out with the idea of airtight containment. As a safety strategy, this is totally counterproductive. In a foolhardy attempt to collect every radioactive atom, we trap hydrogen instead of just letting it escape, collecting the fuel for a bomb. Furthermore, restricting the volume in the presence of a heat source creates the pressure for a bomb. And as we saw at Fukushima, even when this hydrogen gas pressure bomb explodes and scatters what would have been otherwise non-volatile source term into the environment, it is in such low quantities that no one from the public is ever at any risk. If the three gigawatts of core source term plus decades of spent fuel blown up by hydrogen didn't scatter enough radiation to hurt anyone, how can we still classify a light water reactor meltdown as a special accident that needs special regulations? I find it so ridiculous that a light water reactor meltdown could pose any threat to the public whatsoever. I have established a $10,000 prize to go to any nuclear institution that can prove how even one member of the public could be hurt. None of your colleagues in America have been able to prove this yet. Will anyone in this room be the first? If all we did was poke a permanent hole in containment, both physically and ideologically, then in the occasional meltdown, we could just let it melt down. Radioactive gases would escape, instantly dilute, and be no threat. Radioactive liquids would stick to the floor, to the ceiling, to the walls, and be absolutely no threat. Radioactive solids would sit in a molten puddle in the room and be absolutely no threat. That molten puddle would move at most a few feet into the ground and be absolutely no threat. It would be a hot mess in a single room and nothing else. Nobody is asking the public to clean it up with their tongue. If you just wait a few months and then bulldoze it into the ground and spray it with enough water, you will by definition dilute the radionuclides to the point where they are absolutely no threat. Forever. If you are worried about a few kilograms of iodine-129, pour some iodine-127 on it. If you're worried about a few kilograms of cesium-137, pour some cesium-133 on it. All radioactive isotopes can be rendered inert to biology instantly via dilution with a few thousand dollars of stable isotopes. Let us never forget at Fukushima, there was no hazard from the negligible contamination of the land. The only hazard 
was in evacuation, where it was not radiation, but the Japanese government that decided to needlessly destroy the homes and livelihoods of 100,000 of their own people. The public will accept nuclear energy as they do any other energy infrastructure if we, the experts, treat nuclear just like it is any other energy infrastructure. But even more important than public acceptance, which is nice, but not necessary for an industry to thrive, are the economic benefits of treating it just like any other infrastructure. Removing the burdensome influence of overprotection will allow innovation, competition, and manufacturing at scale to drive prices to new lows and speed of deployment to new highs. 1970s nuclear technology should start off at one quarter the price of coal electricity. Just imagine what applying the last 50 years worth of technology and business know-how could do. I know what I'm saying may come across as very brash, very controversial, but I have now given this talk at dozens of universities, national labs, and international conferences. And the reaction that I get from the industry never fails to impress me. Even though I am challenging the very core of a nuclear engineer's identity, and perhaps their entire career's worth of work, without fail, these same nuclear engineers stand up and thank me for saying what they've always felt, but their career has prevented them from saying openly. Now, I know there's a difference between intellectual acceptance and actually changing the culture of an entire industry. In the United States, now that we have such entrenched forces, both within the nuclear industry and competing industries, both acting against cheap nuclear, I'm afraid this challenge will be too difficult for us to accomplish. So this is why I am here in Brazil today. I am here to paint a picture where Brazil, if it is willing to show some courage and stand in contrast to the rest of the nuclear industry, can lead the world into a future of extraordinarily cheap and abundant clean energy. I am here to paint a picture where Brazil can attain intellectual eminence and energy dominance at the world stage. I am here to paint a picture where Brazil can save us all. I ask that your laboratories, industry, and government decide to regulate on a new safety paradigm. That net public benefit is more important than absurd levels of radiation protection. To unlock this promise, just establish a framework where a license is granted immediately, contingent on following these four simple rules. One, reactors must have inherent negative neutrons, just like all light water reactors do. Two, reactors must not be able to catch on fire, just like all light water reactors. Three, reactors must not have airtight containment. A strong roof is good enough. And four, dilution is a sufficient strategy to clean up both waste and accidents. We are in this position now where nuclear is prohibitively expensive and time consuming to build because for the last 50 years, American institutions 
have bullied the whole world into unnecessary safety standards. By making nuclear plants so complicated and expensive, it created an artificial monopoly where only a select few companies had the expertise to build them. This is the real history of nuclear. It is not our association with the bomb that drove fear. The whole world had never been more excited to build nuclear just 20 years after the bomb. It was that in the US, in the 1960s, we realized that building a nuclear plant was almost too easy. There was little defensibility, and anyone who knew the geometry of fuel assemblies and how to build a coal plant could do it. So we in the US lobbied for a new business model to protect our corporate interests. And by the 1970s, our main product was no longer selling electrons. Our main product became selling radiation protection. We were selling fear. To maintain American control over this technology, we employed the long disproven linear no threshold theory. And then we went around the world setting up regulators to enforce it. We overreacted to Three Mile Island to scare the public, to sell more safety upgrades. We overreacted to Chernobyl to scare the public, to sell more safety upgrades. We overreacted to Fukushima to scare the public, to sell more safety upgrades. We have sold the entire world the lie that a nuclear meltdown was unlike any other industrial act. A 1960s light water reactor without all of the unnecessary safety features is a relatively simple endeavor. Brazil, if you can operate, maintain, and fuel Angra, you don't need any outside help to build a new one. If you shrink it down to 100 megawatts, there is no part in a power plant that is beyond your capability to manufacture. There is no part of the fuel supply chain that you haven't already demonstrated mastery over. You do not need American technology. You do not need American know-how. And you certainly do not need American regulations. It will be hard to undo five decades of industry norms, but I promise if you change the way that you regulate nuclear and open it up to the private market, you will see a rush of entrepreneurship from your own people. You will see a flood of foreign capital to accelerate these efforts. And you will produce the cheapest nuclear energy to ever exist. This is your opportunity to create not just an era of Brazilian ascendancy, but an era of Brazilian supremacy. You can save us all from air pollution. You can save us all from climate change. If you are brave enough, the world is in your hands. Obrigado. Thank you.
the truth is why I don't disagree with the dog, you know, I was every area. And everyone was saying the most important thing in Trimar Island was my work. You know, <laughs> it was instrumentation control, it was radiation protection, it was emergency planning. It was, it was, so that was the situation. Uh, you said that you mentioned the Omidas lectures in several places and several conferences. The question I have is have you done that to, to, uh, to bring peace or other uh, anti nuclear group? And what was the reaction? So I haven't brought this to anti-nuclear groups, um, but I have brought this to environmental conferences um, and said the same thing. Uh, I put this same talk up on YouTube after an environmental conference or a similar part talk to this. It got a million views. So I think that there is an underlying feeling that what I'm saying is true, both outside the nuclear industry, anyone who saw Fukushima and no one died can immediately come to the conclusion that we've been stressing out about meltdowns uh, too much all of these years. So that's anyone in the world can see that. And then I think a lot of people, even within the nuclear industry, it's usually the more senior people who are fed up with having seen the industry die, and the very young people who are confused about why are we applying all these regulations, and not the people in the middle who are trying to advance their careers that agree with me the most. So this is the situation that we find ourselves in. I mean, the fact that Fukushima killed no one, isn't that enough to just totally rethink everything, everything that we've ever thought about a nuclear meltdown being this disproportionate hazard? Um, you said about, oh, was you sure the, in the, uh, everything should dilute uh, as a countermeasure for action. So today, no country does it. Um, and you say, oh, someone should start. And how could one country do that? If, for example, in Chernobyl, uh, the Swedes uh, found out by the prison of radiation in the air. Um, in Fukushima, in, uh, there was an increased level of radiation in California. So how would one country be accepted to use dilution as a solution and not, not uh, uh, face the rage of the international community? We in this room all know that just because you can detect a single atom of radioactivity doesn't mean that it's harmful, right? If I had a campfire 5,000 miles away, if I could detect the ash that came out of that campfire, some of it, an atom or two would end up in my lungs, right? So all the time we are emitting toxins into the environment. The question that we have to ask ourselves is what amount is too much? What amount causes a negative reaction to human biology? And right now we are regulating nuclear emissions 10,000 times lower than we have any proof could hurt anyone, even statistically at any level. Okay, that's the situation we find ourselves in. Now, how could we deal with this with the international community? Well, I think that's why Brazil might be a perfect choice to do this. Brazil has already shown the ability to stand up for itself and say, we're gonna do things in the nuclear world without international permission. Um, and if a few other countries joined in too, and realize the benefits of having energy that's 10 times cheaper for their economy, for their industry, for their people, I think you would see the entire nuclear world change their tune in one or two years tops, the entire nuclear world. But somebody has to be a leader. Somebody has to take a little risk. Somebody has to show courage. I wonder if Brazil will be that country that can do this for nuclear. Uh, thank you very much, Fred.